This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, as you can see, it is beginning to look a lot like Christmas, both here in the studio and probably around your home. Thanks so much for tuning in to another edition of the Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Borgamy. Our gift to you this week, the gift of agriculture. Coming up, John Holcomb tours the brand new Fannin County Ag Center and tells us the major impact it will have on the community. Also on the program, fun, food, music, and lots of syrup, but not just any syrup. Ray takes us on a trip down memory lane and tells us how one Georgia town celebrates the handcrafting of cane syrup. And then later, some final thoughts from outgoing GFB Women's Leadership Committee Chair Carol McQueen. How the position has changed her outlook of Georgia Ag and what she has enjoyed the most. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Farm Monitor. With a robotics lab, theater, and dance studio, and even a USDA-sponsored learning garden, the Center for Innovative Learning in Barrow County is breaking the mold of a conventional classroom education. Damon Jones tells you how this vertically integrated program uniquely prepares students for the future and gives them an appreciation for the ag industry. It's no longer just textbooks and Scantron sheets in the classroom for these students at the Center for Innovative Teaching in Winder as this new program places a major emphasis on project-based learning, as well as arts, technology, and agricultural integration. In Georgia, we have kind of this dual, this dual personality. We have all the technology and movies moving in of one industry, but at the other hand, we're a huge agricultural state. And so um, we have a variety of students that have those interests, and so we should be able to cater to both. With more than 100 fifth and sixth grade students in this magnet program and almost as many on the waiting list, the response for this type of curriculum has been overwhelmingly positive. And it's unique projects like the new school garden that have parents very interested. The thing that I've seen um, when I've taught at places that are where st students go for a field trip, they tend to think that nature is somewhere else, it's not at my school. And so a school garden is a way that you can um, have students be exposed to nature a little bit every day over time instead of it just being a fun field trip that you do every once in a while. The students learned that a lot of Barrow County is actually a food desert and that our students and our families don't have access to local fresh foods as much as they should and so that became really important to the students and the students started driving our projects towards we should have better access to food. It's a project these students have taken a real ownership of as they design the layout of the garden and are the ones responsible for building and caring for it throughout the year. They are involved in um, building the raised beds and then filling them with soil and we just planted a cover crop out in the garden for the winter time and then in the springtime they'll help till in the cover crop and plant their spring spring garden so every step of the way and then and then eat the garden is of course. Exposing the students to fresh produce and agricultural practices are just a couple of the objectives for this school garden and the Ag in the Classroom curriculum. I think it has many goals. I think one of them is to learn more about sustainable agricultural practices. So we're teaching about compost and cover cropping and taking care of your soil as an important part of agriculture. Kids are, in, see, are exposed at this age then, even if it's not their primary interest in life to grow food, which most of them it won't be, um, they will have a more, more of a respect for agriculture culture and what farmers do and how hard a job it is and um, and just be more generally more aware of the environmental issues that surround farming. And this is just the beginning as the school system is hoping to expand this program in the future. In fact, they hope this type of learning will become the norm around the county. It's kind of a, two purposes. One is to grow so that we can grow into our next high school that opens up, um, which is going to be a school of choice that is going to very much have the same approach as project-based learning approach to, to learning. The second one um, purpose is uh, for this, these ideas, these teaching practices to grow into our, our regular everyday Barrow Bold style of teaching. Reporting from Barrow County, I am Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Now meanwhile, we've all heard it time and time again, the fact that agriculture is Georgia's largest industry. To prove just how big of a deal it is in Fannin County, the Board of Education there recently built a more than $3 million ag center. Our John Holcomb was there and has the story. It's no secret that agriculture is huge here in the state of Georgia. 
and just how huge it is can be shown in Fannin County by taking a look at their new state-of-the-art ag center, something that was once a vision, now a reality. We acquired this property years ago in anticipation uh, of, of a new school, but our student population is stabilized. Uh, it's about 35 acres. We have a barn, we have a stream. It lends itself so well to this, uh, to this facility and, and uh, as interest grew in agriculture and, and we realized the need for the facility, this seemed to be the perfect choice. The Board of Education come up with a plan and decided to go with it. And thanks to a special local option sales tax, it's completely paid for. This facility is, is roughly three and a half million dollars. Uh, but it is an extensive facility. Uh, it, it's built to classroom standards. It's state of the art. It's a huge upgrade from where their old program was based. When you went to our, old, our former program, which was on our campus, it was a very tight space. It was small. The kids weren't able to bring up their animals as frequently and, and to really have that hands-on experience. Now, in the new building, you'll be lucky to find a tight corner, much less a tight space. And they're all excited to see what kind of success they hope comes with this new facility. If you go into the back and you see the space that we have and the opportunities that they have, the, ant the livestock that's going to be able to be housed here on this, on this facility, and then utilizing this acreage that we have, that is going to translate to more success, I believe, for our students. One great thing about the new facility is that it's not just for the school system. It was also built with intentions of allowing the local ag community to make use of it as well. Our community efforts and involvement will also take you know, a full swing. Uh, after school hours, weekends, you know, when we're not using it during the day. Well, our first priority is for our students, obviously. But because we do recognize that this facility can be utilized in so many capacities, uh, we want the community to be able to benefit from it as well. The next priority being the students due to the fact that they are the next generation and Fannin County wants them to stick around. This will allow students in Fannin County to pursue those interests in agriculture and environmental science uh, and, uh, and, and, and be able to be productive members of the community and fill that need and remain here. Uh, a lot of our students uh, years ago would have to move away uh, for career choices, but. We believe that this facility will allow them to explore opportunities and develop the skills that they need to be productive, successful, and remain here. And remain indeed. Agriculture is a big part of the county's economy, and like most communities in the state or even the nation, they need a younger workforce to be ready to take over someday. Agriculture remains the, the number one industry in Georgia. Uh, it's a very real part of what we do here in Fannin County. Reporting in Blue Ridge for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. When we come back, a celebration like no other. Ray takes us to Jackson, Georgia, and shows us how folks there are preserving a craft passed down through generations. And in this case, still done by hand. One of my favorite quotes is from a guy by the name of John Lennon who said, uh, life happens when you're busy making other plans. We were busy making other plans and now this is our life. So when Hurricane Michael came through, we were braced for a storm. Uh, this is an ecosystem that's managed to be resilient. What we couldn't possibly have been prepared for was that by the time the eye of the hurricane reached us in Baker County here around Newton, Georgia, that it would be maybe a category two, some say up to a category three hurricane, which is winds in excess of 140, 150 miles an hour. And as a result, we, we suffered catastrophic losses here. Hurricane Michael had a major impact on forests in Georgia. About two million acres or 10% of our total state's forest cover was impacted. In the wake of the hurricane, we have a major forest health issue on our hands. Two million acres are gonna to have to be reforested. We also may need to make sure that the timber on the ground doesn't create a tremendous wildfire threat for the rest of the state, as well as forest health issues from the perspective of beetles that can come and attack the healthy trees that are still standing and decimate the rest of the forest throughout our state. We're gonna to have to find creative solutions to make sure that we can restore and reforest the healthy ecosystem and the healthy forest economy in Southwest Georgia. 
I'm the uh, fifth generation manager of the family tree farm. Um, and we have 1,500 acres of timber that's everything from one year old up to the oldest is about 51 years old. So we've got stands in every age category and every stand on the farm was significantly damaged. Uh, I've been in forestry consulting since 1985 and I've been here in Seminole County since 1988. But I would say over 50% of the stands had 60, 70% damage or more. So what you've got now is a situation of your timber value being a, worth a whole lot less because everything's on the ground and broken up. And then you've got, uh, you've got to try to get rid of it at some point in the future. Most people want to replant, however they're not getting the income to replant. Uh, this stand right here is an excellent example. I would estimate uh, before the storm that we might have had $200,000 worth of timber. This is a 100 acre stand. And with the prices that we're getting for salvage, we may get ten dollars to $20,000. Well, we, we just don't really know what to do with it. We, we had a, this was my, my seed, my retirement. You know, I'm 74 years old. I've always said I've been too blessed to be depressed. But let me tell you something. After looking at that stuff, you can get depressed in a hurry. It, it, it's just mind boggling how much we did lose. Some things in life just can't be rushed. Cane syrup definitely makes the list. It's an art form in Southern tradition dating back centuries. That's why every year on the Saturday before Thanksgiving, Dawson Trails Nature Center in Jackson, Georgia plays host to a cane syrup celebration. It's syrup made the old fashioned way with mules, manpower, and most importantly, patience. You know, I grew up with it. Uh, people, a lot of people in this area around uh, Butts County grew up with it. And my grandfather made syrup, and I've got a, I've got a bottle that my grandfather made from 1946. And I'm going to eat it when it's 100 years old. But, uh, yeah, it's just it's near and dear to our heart, and it is an, it's, an, it's an art. So we're here with the Boy Scout troop, actually Cub Scouts, Pack 47 in Noonan, Georgia. So we're actually out here camping for two nights, as well as enjoying the animals over here and then the festival. So it's been pretty cool. You know, you take for granted when you go to a store, you get a bottle of syrup. It's already made. And as a matter of fact, we have pancakes this morning, so it's kind of cool. We tied it in, had the pancakes this morning, talked about syrup, and then actually got to come down and see it made. So it's pretty neat. But yeah, it's a lot of fun, and we think we've been blessed with great weather just about every year. I think a couple of years we've been run off by the rain, but we always get the syrup done. Cane syrup created the old-fashioned way, proving once again that despite modern technologies, some things are just better when made by hand or by man instead of machinery. In Jackson, Georgia, for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ray D'Alessio. Ray, thank you so much. And folks, remember, if you missed any part of Ray's story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel, the Georgia Farm Monitor. Lots of features to choose from. In fact, the archives go back to 2009. While you're there, keep clicking and like the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook page. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a message or comment, send us a message either on Facebook or the address on your screen. That's news at farm-monitor.com. Meantime, with the fourth oldest registered Angus herd in the nation, dating back more than a century, Ames Plantation in Memphis, Tennessee is providing quite the backdrop for researchers at UT's Institute of Agriculture. Ginger Rousey has more on improving production through the numbers of herd management. While most beef cattle farms have a 90-day calving season, we're having around 10 calves a day, so... At Ames Plantation, an historic farm that partners with the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture. The cows deliver their calves within a 30 to 45 day window. It's a lot of work in a short period of time, but it pays off in dividends at the end. And that's what Rick Carlisle, the director at Ames, has spent a career finding solutions for Tennessee cattle farmers. While it may not seem obvious, Carlisle says shrinking the calving season is one of those solutions. Improving the health of the herd and the efficiency of the farm. When you have a three month calving season, the guys were spending a lot of time checking cattle and uh, there are other things to be done with the beef cattle herd, with the pastures, with the forage, with the fencing. So um, we decided to tighten it up. 
So just how did researchers get so many moms on the same page? It all started back in December. Um, started in with a uh, breeding protocol. Using biotechnology, herd breeding is now synchronized and performed artificially. The farm bulls are now plan B. Precision and accuracy is where we are today. Carlisle says the precision breeding has led to improved herd health. Just like humans, expecting cows have special nutritional needs that can be better met when all are in the same stage of production. He also touts the marketability of calves born in a shorter time frame. When you look at the calves that are produced, we have the most uniform set of calves that, uh, that any uh, buyer is looking for. And, you know, eventually that's what you're raising cattle for is, is for the consumer. While 45 day calving season may not be for every producer, the research here at Ames at least highlights the possibilities of using biotechnology in beef cattle production. An historic farm preparing for the future of agriculture. We're on the cutting edge and uh, other producers are looking at us to see how the cattle respond, see how the, uh, the human aspect responds and see what the bottom line responds. In Grand Junction, Ginger Rousey. When we come back, spending time with outgoing GFB Women's Leadership Committee Chair Carol McQueen, her passion for the job and the man who's been there every step of the way supporting her. My name is Bob Schaefer. I'm general manager of Noble Mountain Tree Farm. And Noble Mountain is one of the larger Christmas tree farms in Oregon. Uh, have a little over 4,000 acres under management. I consider myself kind of like the conductor of an orchestra. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of different instruments and people. We have two main farms. One is a little over 2,000 acres in size, which is the largest contiguous Christmas tree farm in the world. We also have a 1,400 acre farm southwest of Monmouth. I started in Christmas trees back in the mid 60s in the fields shaping Christmas trees. Did this for several years in high school and college. This farm had been started by a timber company as a pilot project and they needed somebody who knew how to grow Christmas trees so they asked me to come up here and, and apply and they asked me what the challenges were. I said that there is no way in God's green earth there would be enough people and equipment to harvest our trees on this many acres. And I'd mentioned something about helicopters and they asked me to pursue that. With the helicopter companies and, and our collaboration we developed a, a sling system for actually flying the Christmas trees out by helicopter. Frankly, Noble Mountain would not exist today if that method of harvesting hadn't worked. So this is one of the innovations that we were involved in from the start with that uh, I feel very proud of. I think being a farmer is one of the greatest professions a person could be involved in. Christmas tree growers have to be very forward thinking in that the product that we're growing takes eight, eight to ten years to grow. We're planted in rows like corn and beans and some of the other crops. It just takes us a lot longer to produce the final product. Well, I'm a firm believer in the Farm Bureau. There's a lot of great producers in the Willamette Valley and, and all over Oregon, and they're good businessmen, good marketers. I think sometimes what they don't realize, though, is how much your bottom line can be impacted by politicians. And again, this is why I like the Farm Bureau, because they do a good job in keeping us abreast of what's coming down in the pike that could impact us long term. The beautiful thing about Christmas trees is we have the name of our company and our contact information on every tree that goes out. And every year we get cards, letters, Christmas cards, and pictures of people who've purchased our tree telling us how much they appreciated us spending the time to grow this wonderful product that they could celebrate during the Christmas season. And it's so gratifying to get those cards and letters from consumers who've, who've bought our product and have enjoyed it in their homes during the holiday season and I thoroughly enjoy that as part of my job.
Well, finally this week, as the outgoing GFB Women's Leadership Committee Chair, Carol McQueen pours her heart into everything and anything dealing with Farm Bureau. And for husband Ross, who has served as Henry County's Farm Bureau President since 2010, Carol is his rock, the foundation that keeps him standing tall. This year has been very exciting. I've done a lot of traveling all over the state of Georgia, which I don't normally get to do. It's been from Rome all the way to Valdosta and uh, all the district meetings, but not just board meetings. I've been to district meetings, leadership convention, conferences, everything all over the state. Growing up in rural Henry County, I've been in Henry County all my life, so I grew up in the farming, agricultural, rural area all my life. And so when Ross and I married about 40 years ago, we finally got to have our own farm. And so we've been growing hay and uh, it's become a passion. We had cattle at one time. We don't have any cattle anymore, but we feed horses and cows all in our area. But it's just something we raised our kids in. As teenagers, they helped us on the farm and we just still want to do it, even though we're on a smaller scale now. Farm Bureau is like a family. Uh, by her having this job, I've got to go and visit farms all over this state that I wouldn't have got a chance to do that. And I enjoy visiting somebody's farm. Uh, got to eat a lot of chicken in a whole lot of places and meet a whole lot of fine people. And if she didn't have this job, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. Now, I probably enjoyed her job more than she has because she did the work and I get to have the fun. Attending the board meetings has really opened my eyes to what it takes and how many men and women are behind the scenes to make this such a fine organization. Georgia Farm Bureau is so lucky to have the leadership we do. Um, and until you're sitting in that boardroom, you can't possibly understand what that is and that commitment that everybody has. It, it's it's mind-blowing. Once this year is over, I'll go back to uh, more of what I do locally. We have a school that's uh, two miles from me right here and uh, I make a point to go there at least once a month and do reading or whatever they need, but um, I'll just go back to doing the local things. I'll still be able to go to conventions and in leadership, I'll definitely go to the Educational Leadership Conference every year because we learn so much there, but I won't be out of Georgia Farm Bureau, but I will be in the background supporting those that are uh, continuing to serve. It won't change a whole lot. She's, there's still plenty of meetings to go to. We still, you know, we, we go to the American and we go to the state and we travel an awful lot. You ask our dog, uh, she, you know, she misses us more than anybody else. Yeah, she has been incredible in that role, and we certainly wish her the best. And we'd like to wish you the best as we put the wraps on the show. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening out on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.